Well, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to our pastor's Bible study. We are all in various locations, uh, but we, we wanted to get together this week uh, here in our, in our first one during the Read Scripture Challenge to talk about uh, part of the readings for this week. So from, you know, looking back to Sunday uh, through the end of the weekend, we are reading basically the first half of the book of Genesis, you guys. Uh, it's chapters 1 through 24. And, you know, when you, um, when you actually are watching this Bible study, maybe you haven't read through it all yet, that's fine. Or maybe you're watching it a little bit later. Um, but we're going to go through, basically, I, I think the, what, what I sent to you guys as a little outline, the title was, The Story of Abraham in 60 Minutes or Less. Um, I don't know if that's even possible, guys. We could do 600 minutes on Abraham, and yet we are going to try 60 minutes uh, or less or less. So you guys can, can guess what, how close it will get to 60. Um, so first of all, I mean, you guys, just very, very briefly, what is, how has this challenge been going for, for you guys so far with the reading? Well, we, Anna and I have been just absolutely loving it. Um, each night we've done it, you know, we've, I mean, it's probably been like an hour each, you know, with reading and conversation. And it's, it's almost become like a running joke now where like, you know, we'll start the reading for the day and we'll get like a half a sentence in and be like, you know, that's interesting. Or, you know, <laughs> and I, I honestly think we've not gone more than three sentences with the exception of the lineages. I don't think we've gone more than three sentences without stopping and, and talking about something. And so uh, it's, it's honestly, it's far exceeded what I thought it was going to be uh, as far as, you know, was hoping for some discussion. Uh, I was hoping to enjoy it and it's, it's gone above and beyond and uh, being feeling very blessed by it for sure. Awesome. Great to hear. Yeah, it, um, Genesis is such a foundational book uh, to set the stage for whatever comes afterwards. Uh, and, uh, you know, throughout my long ministry, I've had the privilege of teaching the two-year Bethel Bible study series that covers the whole Bible. As a matter of fact, most of my reading through the whole Bible is in connection with, with teaching Bethel. And there's uh, over 60 St. Paul members that have gone through that with me a few years ago. But anyway, um, as I go through Genesis again, all, all the Bethel concepts just pop out again because, uh, you know, again, because the, the, the weaving of God's salvatory story, his story of salvation, uh, really starts, you know, I don't know how you knit, but those first few uh, you know, way, things in which you put around those knitting poles have got to be foundational. And that's, Genesis is just great. I mean, it's just great. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I also do not know how to knit or crochet or any of those things. Um, and I'd probably get them all, all mixed up. Yeah, you're right. These are, the, the book of Genesis, you know, yeah, I, I, I think, there was one time I was talking with some other people like if you could only have a few books of the Bible you know like which ones would you have to have and I feel like you'd have to put Genesis on the short list just because it does it introduces yep. so many it introduces you know kind of like you were talking about um in your sermon this past Sunday pastor the that cycle that is ongoing yep. sin and judgment and grace um again and again and again and we know we know that the story will end in grace <laughs> um which is good news, even though we keep going through cycles of sin and judgment. Um, okay, well, you know, I was just, yeah, I was gonna well, add one more thing. So I, I put this, this is a part of my, uh, my devotional video for Thursday, but I think, um, I really think, you know, at least Pastor Smith, I think at least you will appreciate this. Um, maybe Pastor Bugler, I don't know, I'll find something out about you. Uh, I talk about how it's kind of like, uh, going through the Bible again is going, is like going back and watching like the star Wars movies or the Avengers movies, 
you know, for those of us who have seen all of them, we know the story, but then you go back and you watch it and you get to see it, not taking it in for the first time, but getting to see some of those little details. And, you know, like one way of thinking about it is we know the overstory. We know God's work in history. And now we kind of see the understory, the, the smaller details of, uh, of God's story. And that has been uh, one of the more exciting parts about this. We were talking about this in the, in the pre-game show uh, before we started recording, but you know the world does not start out in a good place. In the first twelve chapters, God has basically re- regretted creating humanity twice. You know, and getting to to see those details and be like, oh, that you know that really that really hits you. Yeah. So yeah, I just thought I'd share that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, keep in mind that stuff like the Sodom and Gomorrah story happened after the flood. <laughs> you know, what we actually we actually don't get that many details about what was so bad, you know, specific stories about what was so bad before, other than every inclination of man's heart was turned toward evil. <laughs> um, that kind of sums it up, but but it seems that that also continues as well after the flood. Um, so we begin, um, we're going to start today, if you want to open your Bibles up, uh, to Genesis chapter 12, but I'm going to throw a curveball even then, because that, that's when, uh, basically when Abram comes on the scene, but I want to take us to the book of Joshua, which the, you guys are like, what is happening here? Um, so the book of Joshua, chapter 24, I, I'll read this, verses 2 and 3, actually gives us a little bit of background information on Abram and his family. Uh, So here's what it says. Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, long ago, your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates. Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan, and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac. We'll stop there. So I don't know what what you guys have always thought, but I, I think when I was, before I, I kind of discovered this little backstory of Abraham's family, I assumed that Abram was probably more like Noah, you know, that God was looking over all the earth and then <clears> saw <throat> this, this, this man who was following him, this, this righteous man, and um, then he makes these promises uh, to him. Um, but that is not the case. <laughs> um, so let's so let, let's read Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Um, Pastor Josh, would you read that for us? Um, and then we'll kind of talk about that together with, with the Joshua passage and some other things. You said 1 through 3? 1 through 3, yeah, 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Whoa. Okay. So I don't know about you guys, but but the fact... Uh, for me, at least, knowing what Joshua 24 says about Abram gives some extra, extra punch, kind of, to the, to the blessings then that God pronounces upon Abram. Um, so what, what does this tell us about God and the kind of people that he calls to be part of his salvation story? Well, um first of all that it's all about god you know uh, uh, what was that 40 original 40 day purpose that uh you know we went through years ago i think the first chapter was it's not all about you mm-hmm. you know it, it, or up in our uh, upper room you know the bulletin board said it's still all about jesus if you look at that joshua passage again it's not really joshua retelling the history of the children of israel before they go into the to the land, but it's really, Joshua says, 
here's what the Lord our God said to us. And then it's all, I took your father Abraham from the land. I gave him Isaac. I gave him Jacob. I gave him Esau. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I inflicted the Egyptians. And when I came to the sea, I parted the sea. In other words, and it just goes on and on. The whole history of, uh, of what we're going to be reading about over the next uh, couple of weeks is God in action. And so here, uh, clearly, after the Tower of Babel scattering, you know, God saw to it that language was all disrupted so they couldn't do that evil among themselves, corporate evil. They couldn't even communicate with one another. And then he scattered, uh, you know, the sons of Noah, Hem, Sham, and Japheth. He scattered them to different parts of the world even. Uh, you know, we're, we as Europeans flow out of uh, uh, Shem. Uh, yeah, no, J uh, Japheth. Shem stays in Israel. Ham goes down into Egypt. And, uh, and, and then he starts giving the descendants and, and he ends up with Terah and his sons. Uh, okay, and they're over in the Tigris River Valley. They're way over in what would eventually be Babylon, or, or it was Babylon then too. You can go to the Hanging Gardens of Babylon to this day in Iran. Uh, and so this is how God did it. And yeah, here's the surprising thing. He didn't pick one who was already a deep follower of, uh, of his will. He picked somebody who was worshiping other gods, which, by the way, most people on the face of the earth were. Uh, we don't have uh, we don't have faithful followers of God's will at this point. Uh, as Josh said, you know, the <laughs> opening chapters of Genesis, the world was pretty much a mess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so if he's going to start with somebody in terms of his grace movement, uh, he picks somebody who's following other gods and he does it all. I, I just wanted to emphasize that. You know, it's not about us. It's not about Abraham. As a matter of fact, we're going to see early on here, Abraham is not perfect, despite the fact that we call him the father of faith. I mean, there's a lot of flaws, mm. <laughs> but it all it's all about what God does. Still is today. Yeah. Still is today. You don't want to get puffed up when you realize that uh, we're a mess. Yeah, we, we are not, yeah, we're a mess. We are not deserving. We do not, you know, like, oh, yes, I, I deserve to be called by God, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, Pastor Josh, any observations on this passage? Yeah, this, uh, this is a passage that I, whether directly or indirectly, reference a good amount in my sermons. Um, this is... This is the beginning of God establishing his people. And from the beginning, he says, you will be a blessing. And, all, uh, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. You know, from, so from the very beginning of God establishing his chosen people, that was part of their purpose, was to be a blessing to all families on the earth. Um, and so... I, I say that because, you know, that's, we are children of Abraham through, through faith in Jesus. Um, but also, I, I, you know, I'm kind of excited to, with those eyes, look as, you know, as we continue to go through, especially the Old Testament, uh, to see that. And I know, you know, when you get to Leviticus, there are, uh, there are a number of examples, you know, like, don't get the, uh, when you're going to harvest, don't go to the edge of your property, but leave a little bit so that, uh, I don't know if it's the, the traveler or the poor person has, you know, can get a little bit or, you know, so there are a number of examples, but um, that's, you know, from the beginning of when God establishes people, it was, part of it was you're going to be a blessing to other people. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great point. Yeah, this is this is one of those passages, like you said, that really it looms very large in the Old Testament. Um, 
for sure. But I mean, it, it should it should loom large for us too. <laughs> um, this is a huge promise. There's actually I, I don't know if you, if you sit down and count them, just in those couple verses where God is speaking to Abram, there are seven blessings. There's a there's a good holy biblical number for us, seven blessings, and yeah, um, and it really it culminates in um, the promise of of the coming Savior who will come through this family. Um, one of our now Pastor Bugler, I know that you've already admitted that you don't remember anything from seminary, nor do you remember any of your professors or anything that they've said, um, but <laughs> but. Uh, but I, I, had, I had a professor named uh, Dr. Reed Lessing, um, just a, a great, great LCMS theologian. Um, I think he, he is now a parish pastor again, but was at the seminary for the first two years when I was there. And I had a class on the first five books of the Bible with him. And he would always refer to this passage, Genesis 12, 1 through 3, as the first great commission. Um, so we know that the, the Great Commission that we usually refer to is, you know, when Jesus sends out, you know, his disciples to go out and make more disciples, you know, baptizing and teaching. Um, that's, that's what we're, we're still, we're part of that. Um, we're part of the Great Commission. But this would, the first Great Commission, um, and I think it goes along with what Pastor Josh, what you were saying, you know, is uh, he sends Abram out to go and be a blessing, you know, to bless other people. Um, and really he's going, God is going to use him and his family and his descendants, even though they are unworthy and unprepared right then, but he's going to equip them and use them to bless other people mightily, um, you know, according to his own plans. So that, that's, a, that's kind of a cool thing to see that, uh, like, you know, it really is, you know, the parallels of God establishing his people right here and sending them out. Um, sometimes, you know, the places that they've never gone before, maybe. Um, and then how he establishes his church in Matthew 28 and then sends us out. So uh, a unifying thing between the Old and New Testaments that we see. And we're going to pick up on a lot more of those things um, as we go. Can I be a devil's advocate? against um, Reed Lessing? No. Not against him. Let's uh, skip past that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Sure. Uh, I brought out in my uh, sermon last Sunday the two types of covenants, the covenant of human obligation and the covenant of divine obligation. And, uh, you know, covenant is an arrangement, a deal, uh, an agreed upon uh, path for the future. And uh, I think the great commission in Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me. Now I'm going to give it to you. Go be my disciples, baptize, uh, you know, all nations, teach them all the things that I have commanded you uh, for lo, I'll be with you always. But it's still a lot about you, about human obligation. And, uh, and, and uh, this covenant to Abraham, the, the, the great commission to Abraham, has nothing to do with Abraham. It's all up to God. And whether or not the children of Israel um, follow the Lord or whether they, as they so often did, go away from him, disobey him, nonetheless, this covenant, God's going to do irregardless uh, of Abraham. You know, the actor is all God. And I think that's, that's an important distinction. There, there are some things that we do out of uh, human obligation because of what, you know, God has done for us. Uh, so, so that's just a thought I had about, uh, about uh, the uniqueness of this covenant. Uh, and, and there's also covenants like that in the, in the New Testament, too, about Jesus Christ. It's not going to depend upon us. Christ's going to come back again, whether we're ready for him or not. And, you know, there are other covenants of divine obligation, thank God, that bless our lives. Just a thought. Yeah. Well, I'll be forward. Reed Lessing would have an answer for that. I'll be forwarding this footage uh, to him directly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I have, I have some thoughts too, but, but definitely <clears throat> they're, um, 
yeah, they're, they're not kind of one-to-one exactly the same. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Um, we can, we'll argue off the air, you know, we'll, we'll say, I'm just kidding. We, we folks, we love each other un- unconditionally in this cat world team. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so we move on then and, and, and uh, guys, we're, there's no way we can cover everything. So we do have to kind of skip some things. So we're, we're fast forwarding, uh, through, through some things, uh, not commercials, but just other things. So the one thing that, that really struck me. Uh, when I was reading these things again, was Abram, not one time, but two times, lies about his wife, Sarai, Sarah, you know, um, maybe we'll just call him Abraham and Sarah just for the sake of continuity here. But he, first of all, you know, he, he goes to Egypt and he's afraid. He thinks that Pharaoh is going to kill him because he wants to take Sarah for himself because she's a beautiful woman. Um, and then that went so well the first time I'm saying that sarcastically that then he does it again. <laughs> um, years later with, when he's with a man named Abimelech. So both times he said, Oh, she's my sister. And technically that is true. He's, he explains later on, you don't have to get into the whole we won't, we won't go too far down that path. Um, but it's, it's just amazing because, okay, so we've just read these lavish promises that God has given to Abram and his family. And yet, um, Abraham doesn't fully trust that God is going to um, work those things out. So... <clears throat> You know, and, and, and not only that, so it, it's not only trusting for protection, but it's also trusting another big promise as God, God makes kind of very high level promises in chapter 12, one through three, but let's act, let's zoom in on even another one. So we'll go to chapter 15. Now, Pastor Bugler, if you could read the first six verses in Genesis 15. after this, yeah, 15 uh, verses one to six. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Uh, Do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield. I'm your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus, uh, one of his servants, by the way. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up to the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And he said, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. A verse that gets uh, repeated in the New Testament, by the way. Oh yeah, what what a what a great Lutheran verse right there. Um, yeah, going that we we receive righteousness by faith, just as Abraham does right here. Um, so this the whole story of Abraham. Um, I, I also am reminded of the the man who is speaking to Jesus, um, during his ministry, and he says, "You know, I believe. Help my unbelief." Because we see right here, this, this is power. Abraham believes God, but then time passes and it's tough to be patient sometimes to, to wait on the Lord's um, action. And then you doubt. Um, and so, so we see, you know, Abraham, he tries to take matters into his own hands um, uh, in, in several things. He, you know, he, like we already talked about, he lies about Sarah being, uh, you know, not being his wife. God protects him there. And then even after this story, when God promises that he will have a son, that he and Sarah will have a son um, against all odds, Abraham and Sarah still try to take things into their own hands. Sarah says, here's my servant, Hagar. Um, And then he goes and shacks up with her. And then she has a baby, Ishmael. Um, And then everything spirals out of control after that because they try to take it into their own hands. Now I'm sure 
that none of us, none of the three of us and none of us <laughs> watching this Bible study here have ever gotten impatient with God and tried to um, take things into our own hands. Not none of us, other people, perhaps. No, we've all done that. Um, so why, why does that happen? What makes us do that? What, what made Abraham and Sarah do that? Um, why don't we always trust God to work things out himself? Why do we have to meddle and mess things up? You guys can answer this. You can solve a major problem in the world. <laughs> well, I just think, you know, what is faith? It, it's believing what we can't see. And, um, you know, we can't, we can't see God today. We can't, you know, see the promises that he has for us. You know, like we can read the promises, but when we can't see the deliverer of the promises, it, it makes it, it, it gives it a feeling of like, in contrast with the very real things that we have, the control that we have over certain situations. Like if, you know, if I need to get something, I can just go to the store and get it as opposed to, you know, trusting that God is going to deliver something. Uh, and there's a whole balance of trusting God versus doing something with the gifts that he's given you. But it's easier for us to be in control and to, to act on something than to be passive and, and wait for just, just in general to wait for anybody else to do it. You know, if something needs to be done, I know most people are like, I'd rather trust myself and get it done. You know, it, unless it's like, you know, I'm sure there are plenty of husbands out there that, uh, and I'm not one of them yet, but that is like, Oh, I don't need to hire a plumber. I can just do this myself. You know, there are certain jobs, but in large, you know, you want to get something done and have it know that it's getting done you do it yourself and so it's, it's hard to it's hard to rely on somebody else especially when that somebody else is someone you can't see or hear their voice direct remember when we did galatians uh, as our bible study a few months back and we talked about jesus plus you know that the judaizers they believed Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead, but they also believed that they had to add uh, faithfulness to the law of Moses in, in order to be uh, true Christians. And, and this is the heart and core of Satan's temptation to Adam and Eve, you know? Yeah, he gave you this whole garden, but you can be like God, you know? If you eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know, it's the it's the plus stuff that uh, Pastor Josh, you, you quoted really without, uh, without saying where it was, Hebrews 11, you know, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the confidence of things we cannot even see. Uh, and and uh, that's where Abraham and Sarah got themselves in trouble several times. Not only the lies to Egypt and Abimelech, but, uh, you know, the passing off of Oh, gosh, we're already in our 80s, and, and we're supposed to have this son, and it's been 12 years, and we're still not pregnant. Good grief. I was 80 when the promise was given. Now I'm 92. Uh, that's a long time <laughs> waiting, for, waiting for a son. When you know. By the way, about that age business, uh, isn't that something that Sarah in her 80s was a really beautiful woman? That's, a, that's an interesting twist in the story, too. So that he thought that the, those young Egyptians would uh, want that old cougar or whatever. That's bad. Bad <laughs> biblical interpretation. But anyway, uh, uh, so here we've got... Uh, <laughs> stay with me here, Pastor Smith. Uh, here, here we've got some classic illustrations of what's just built into the human DNA that we're not... You know, you know, we we have faith, like you were saying, Pastor Josh, but it seems like we have to add the plus, uh, and and forget that it's all about God. It's not about us. And and but but God sticks with Abraham over and over and over again. He keeps saying, "Okay, Abraham, uh, let's go outside. Look up into the sky. Uh, look how many stars there are. If you can even count them, trust me, Abraham." 
your nation is going to have as many as those stars. Uh, and, uh, and so, I, you know, it's just a wonderful piece of theology for us today. Faith is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Doubt is a terrible thing. Yeah. And, and I think that makes Abraham such a relatable, I mean, Abraham and Sarah, both such relatable people, um, you know, so early in the story of the Bible that, you know, I'm like, oh man, I have felt that way so often, you know, maybe you haven't had their exact life experiences or maybe, maybe you have, you know, maybe it's been, you know, waiting a long time, you know, for a child or just for something, for something else that you've been longing for, praying for. Um, but God, it, it is, it is awesome too, even though it is a long time period, God does keep coming back with reassurances, kind of like doubling down on, on the promises that he's made. He doesn't just leave them to kind of, you know, blow in the wind and, and wait entirely. Um, but it is, yeah, that very, very re real human beings that God chooses and uses and, um, and God's response to us, to Abraham, to Sarah, to us, when we doubt that forgiveness, that faithfulness to us, even though we are not always uh, faithful to him. Uh, praise be to God. For those We're going to see this played out over and over and over in the children of Israel. How many times did God yeah. promise them yeah. uh, that, that he would provide, that he would take over, the children of Israel would doubt, mm -hmm. and uh, he'd have to, you know, again, that, that talk about that cycle of sin, judgment, grace. There's also this cycle of promise, doubt, recovenant, yeah. more promise, doubt, more promise. <laughs> It's it's like when I tell, to our, it's yeah. like when I, I tell Hunter that he can have a snack in thirty minutes and then you know he he doesn't believe me after five you know I have to tell him like every five minutes. Yeah, you're right. I have yeah. to make a covenant yeah. with him. You know, I have to w walk between the orange slices. You know, to promise that <laughs> he's going to get um, a snack soon. Uh, not really, but okay. So we we got to go then. Um, to Genesis chapter 18. So this is, um, you know, this is after, after Abraham, you know, we always, we always give Sarah a hard time for laughing when God promises that she's going to have a son. Abraham also laughed in a separate time. So his is the less famous laugh. Uh, Sarah, <laughs> Sarah, Sarah laughs, but so does Abraham. Uh, but after these, you know, three visitors come, uh, we believe that it's, uh, you know, God and a couple angels. Uh, we won't get too deep into that. But they, after they, they reaffirm that they will have a son soon, then God has to turn his judgment against uh, a wicked city. You know, well, a couple of them, Sodom and Gomorrah, where Abraham's nephew Lot and his family are living. Um, and so we have here Abraham interceding. So he is having just a, this amazing conversation with God. Um, let's see, Pastor Josh, I guess it's your turn. Could you read uh, Genesis chapter 18, verses 22 to 33? So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood before the Lord. Then Abram drew near, Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous people within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare, the, spare it to the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as, uh, fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall you? Shall not the judge of the entire earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. I, uh, I who am of ashes, or I am, I am but ashes and dust. Suppose five of the 50, five, uh, 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for, uh, for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. 
again, he spoke to him and said, suppose 40 and 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham. Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. All right. So I, I have this, I had a chuckle at this uh no, footnote in my study Bible. It said, perhaps considering that God had not spared the world from the flood for the sake of eight people, Noah's household, Abraham did not press any further. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, it is interesting. I never thought about that. I just thought, oh, you know, God oh. walked away. <laughs> it's like, I'm not going to let this guy push anymore. But um, yeah, you know, there are, there are, some takeaways I think that, that we can have from this. One for me is personally that the next time I am buying a, a car, I'm going to take Abraham <laughs> with me. Uh, he is a, a tremendous negotiator. You know, he'll get that price down for you. Um, I mean, this is, you know, shaves off 40, 40 people from this. Um, but, but all, all kidding aside, well, most kidding aside, what, what do we learn here in this great negotiation with God um, that Abraham has. Obviously, Abraham has a special relationship with God here. Not just anybody kind of has this frank of a conversation. Um, but what, what do we learn about Abraham? Or, or what do we learn about God? Um, what do we learn about even prayer? We could say this is like a prayer. Well, I, I think that... Uh... I'll just take one of them. I won't, I won't take all of them. I won't be that selfish. Um, I just think this highlights the character of God who, uh, you know, we'll see this a number of times throughout the Bible. God doesn't change his mind in the sense of like, you know, somebody's on his way to kill somebody and somebody talks him out of doing that. And God, like, like God can separate his emotion from his, uh, from his actions right like you know if us humans can't really do that and so somebody when they're when they're set on something in anger it's hard to turn them away but god can do that and and god is angry because of of this horrible sin but we see that god is his his dominant character is his, his grace and his his patience and his his wanting to uh wanting to be slow to to anger and uh, you know, you, you see what Abraham does is he calls the character of God to himself. Uh, he says, you know, will, will not the good judge uh, spare these people for the sake of, you know, 40 or, you know, however many. And, and so it's, it's God's character that is being held up to him. And, uh, and so it's just it's a, it's a start of a great theme throughout the Bible is, yes, God does deal with sin he's a just God. He has to, but wherever, wherever he can, he is slow to anger and he looks to hold off on giving what wicked sinners deserve. A couple thoughts uh, in Luke 18. I think it's uh, Jesus tells the parable of the persistent woman who goes before the judge and wants relief and and the judge doesn't give it to her, and she goes again, and she goes again, and she goes again, and finally the judge says, oh, good grief, give this woman what she wants. I can't stand her persistence. So when you, uh, Pastor Smith, talked about prayer, that, that's what came to mind, because Jesus is teaching us there uh, to be persistent, to, to continue the negotiations. He loves, because he sees that, you know, as, a, as faith blooming, the blooming of faith. You know, that you don't give up. God doesn't want people who are too quick to give up. 
And then I think too, uh, that happens often in this story that's going to unveil in Exodus and Numbers of how often the people come to Moses and murmur. And Moses goes to the Lord and says, they're really bugging me, Lord. Can you, can you please help me out here as a leader of these obstinate people? You know, and, and it does seem as though it's a negotiation. Uh, Pastor Josh, I love the way you put it. You know, the Lord is long suffering. <laughs> that his compassion is, uh, you know, extends beyond what we would even think of. Uh, because he knows he's dealing with sinful people. The other thing I thought about this Sodom and Gomorrah thing is, you know, uh, his nephew Lot lives there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that story is coming yet. But way back in chapter 13, right after uh, the covenant was made in chapter 12, uh, Lot and Abraham and his whole family are very wealthy. And they've got flocks and herds. And there doesn't seem to be enough uh, land and they're Servants start arguing about, we want this part for our pasture, and we want this part for our pasture, and they fight over where their flocks can graze, and Abraham says, oh, well, wait a minute, let's divide up the land, and he gives Lot the choice, and Lot, of course, chooses the, where the pastures are the nicest. Only problem is, it's also where Sodom and Gomorrah are, which are known before Abraham's story as very, very wicked cities. So while it looked as though for Lot, it was a smart choice in terms of sustaining his livestock, it was a bad choice because he was gonna come under the influence of a lot, a lot of evil. And so when God's saying to Abraham here, I'm gonna destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham is, is filled with love for the rest of his family. And, and so he is bargaining you know, hopefully to at least save Lot and his family from destruction. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I can understand why he is so persistent in his negotiation. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. There, there's, it, there's a personal <laughs> uh, desire in there too um, for his family. And again, you know, this is, uh, God, God does graciously, um, make a way for them to uh to get out of there <laughs> not the most deserving people maybe <laughs> you know to to be blessed by god in that way but but god does does make a way for them um you know because because of their connection to abraham probably but yeah this is uh this is such a fascinating time i, I like how you guys pointed out you know uh parallels to moses and his prayers to god it reminds me of some of the prayers like in the psalms david and others mm -hmm. just pray, you know kind of um yeah. out the character of god and his past gracious actions um you know his <laughs> anger I, I think sometimes you know we, we hear that description of god he's slow to anger sometimes we focus more on the oh wait he gets angry <laughs> it's like well we should be really focusing on the slowness yes he does get righteously angry um, but it is slow. He's, he doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't have a short temper. Um, you don't want to face his righteous temper, but but he it is slow. Even uh, even for, you know, this is um, kind of a, a throwaway verse. I can't remember which uh, chapter it's in now. It's in one of these. Um, basically, he tells Abraham, God tells Abraham, um, yeah, you're not going to inhabit the land yet because the sin of the Amorites is not yet complete. Basically, I'm giving them 400 more years, and then their time's going to be up. That's pretty slow to anger. I, I, wish, I, <laughs> wish, I, I wish I could have like four seconds sometimes of patience. <laughs> 400 years, that, that's amazing. So, um, no, a good, a good conversation there uh, to bring up. Uh, chapter 19 is one of the one of the darker chapters in the Bible, we get Sodom and Gomorrah and we get this, you know, truly tr disturbing story about Lot and his daughters. Um, we're, we're not going to really go into those things. We're going to skip ahead here to, to one, one last um, conversation, but yeah, it's, you know, when I was reading some of the, through some of those things, I was thinking, man, it's a good thing that God made that covenant with Noah. Good thing he put that rainbow up in the sky because as we discussed earlier, 
man, he, you don't blame God for wanting to hit the reset button on this creation. Um, so we, we go forward um, to Genesis chapter 22. In the meantime, Isaac has been born. God has fulfilled that promise. He is beginning to make a great nation out of Abraham, just as he's been promising for so long. And then this has just got to be the, the last thing that Abraham ever expected. What God commands him to do next. Um, let, me, let, let me start reading here uh, from Genesis chapter 22. So it says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. We'll stop right there. Abraham's going. He's going to do it. Um, you know, it says that he's, God is testing him. We, we throw that word around sometimes on being tested by God. Another word that almost sounds the same is tempt. Test or tempt. Um, is there a difference between the two? Um, who's maybe, who's the source of each one? You know, who's, who might test us? Who might tempt us? And what's going on here? Well, as frail as our English language goes, and uh, it is frail many times, it, it, I think that we can draw this distinction that tempting is the work of the devil. Lead us not into temptation. And uh, Martin Luther's explanation attributes that kind of temptation to the devil. And if so tempted, give us the strength, Luther says, to overcome. Uh, and testing uh, is oftentimes used, and as a matter of fact, is used in Hebrews as something even a loving father would do in order to discipline and correct uh, their, their children or a loving mother to be gender neutral. Uh, so testing is, can be a positive thing to someone who loves the person being tested. Tempting is a destructive thing by someone who hates the person being tempted. That's, I think, the easiest way for us to just embrace those two terms. But, but also it's a you know, it's the same thing as why does God allow suffering? And I, I hate that word allow because it, it, while it is true, you know, it appears that God allowed Satan to do all those terrible things to Job. Uh, the truth of the matter is when we use that English word allow, it too often thinks of God up there ignoring or not caring about the suffering that we're going through. And there's no biblical evidence for that. So these words, these English words fall a little bit flat, but I think in a simplistic way, testing and tempting have two different objectives and they come from two different sources. One is based on love, the other is based upon hatred. Yeah, yeah, very good. I, I think one of, one of the ways, a, a shorthand way that I was taught to was, um, Testing is meant to strengthen your faith, and tempting is meant to destroy your faith. So the source, the source of one is God, and the source of the other is yeah. Satan. Um, yeah. So I think we, yeah, obviously we, we shouldn't say that um, God ever tempts us. That, that's not His purpose here. Now this is, I mean, there's some stuff that frankly we're just not going to totally understand about this story. You know, yeah. exactly. You know, what, why is this the? Is, is this what? what uh the way that god chooses to, to test abraham um you know i sometimes I, I like to put myself into the shoes of um of our biblical forefathers our biblical brothers and sisters and 
you know, think, well, what in the world was running through their minds um, when something like this happened? And, and I don't know, you know, you guys might be able to, to think, well, I bet Abraham was feeling this way or he was thinking this. Um, well, actually, the Bible tells us what Abraham was thinking during this. And it goes back, I think one of you guys mentioned this earlier, the book of Hebrews um, chapter 11. This is where um, we sometimes call it like the faith chapter, the faith hall of fame is, is one way that it's put. And Abraham takes up a good chunk of that. And the, the writer to the Hebrews um, gives us this insight, led along by the Holy Spirit, to, to tell us what was going on in Abraham's mind. I'll read that. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. That is... You know, we, we can we can talk about Abraham being kind of wishy-washy and doubting. That is powerful faith that only comes from the Holy Spirit of God to think, I don't know what God has planned for this, but even if I have to slay my own promised son, I bet God can raise him up. <laughs> um that just that floors me whenever I read that. Yeah. I mean, this is uh, this 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 is a tough this is a tough story to read for me uh, before I had kids, and then you know now it's like oh man, it really hits you hits you in a different way. Um, so so let let me let me just finish out the the story here, and then we can we can kind of have our closing reactions to it. Um, so. When they, they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. It's tough to even, you know, <laughs> have any words. This is a powerful. This is where Abraham got the title father of faith. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is, you know, if, if we see him coming out of the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley, worshiping other gods, mm -hmm. here is where he has reached the epitome of why he is the father of faith. This, this is an amazing story. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Isaac even said, hey, hey, dad. We got the fire in the wood here, but where is the lamb? Oh my goodness! Yeah. Talk about an opening to a Lenten sermon, right? Yeah. Uh, about you know the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, or or Abraham's calling of the place, the place where the Lord provides. Another great sermon there. I mean, this is uh, this is just a great story about faith, and. Uh, May we embrace it uh, and strive for that kind of faith. Again, that is the assurance of things hoped for, the confidence of things not seen. Mm. We're not, not going to be able to reason this stuff out. No, 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 no. But, uh, but by faith, you know what? We're children of the Heavenly Father, and we've got eternity in our uh, future. And all things work together for good. You know, I got a Bible study on like 16 verses of the Bible that there's no way you can embrace unless you just embrace them with faith. Uh, and Abraham is the father. It's a great story. Yeah. Pastor Josh, any, any closing thoughts on this story or anything else? Yeah, I was going to talk about verse eight as well. The 
you know, says God will provide for him, for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And just thinking about Abraham at the time, not knowing that that lamb would not be his son, you know, like that, that is the epitome of, of faith right there. But it also does highlight that in this story, God himself provided the lamb. Mm -hmm. the, the sacrifice, the sacrifice that God demanded of Abraham, God provided. And the sacrifice that God demanded for the sins of mankind, God provided himself. And I just think that is the, it, this one most powerful couple of verses in, in the whole Bible in my opinion. Really, yeah. really weaves a lot throughout the whole Bible. It does. It does. Yeah. And, and, you know, where Abraham doesn't have to sacrifice his son, God, the father does, uh, you know, to, to spare all the other sons and daughters uh, that he has. Yeah. Powerful stuff. Um, and I, I just think of, you know, we, we do get the little from Hebrews, we get the little peek into Abraham's mind, but for me, um, I, I'm imagining Abraham repeating all those promises from God as he's walking up that mountain, as he's preparing the altar. And for us, you know, I pray that, that God will keep putting those words of promise in our minds, whatever we're walking through, whatever challenges, whatever testings, whatever sufferings, um, so that we can hang on to those promises that, that he has fulfilled already and even the the future promises that he is bringing us into um yeah because we're we're all abraham and sarah <laughs> um these are our our ancestors and and we're the same as them and we have the same promises and we have the same eternal hope in the one who would come to bless all families of the earth our lord jesus um this it's been a great kickoff to our read scripture challenge uh a, the book of Genesis, the first half. Um, and now we will get into future members of the family, like Isaac and Jacob and Joseph uh, next week. So we'll, we'll talk about more of them uh, next week. But uh, thank, thanks to you guys, uh, pastors. Thanks to everyone who has tuned in here. Uh, and God's blessings on the rest of your week. And as you delve even... Hey, can I have a footnote before you give the final blessing? Uh, I was, can I have a footnote? I was going to end with a flurry. How are you going to say no to me? <laughs> <laughs> I was at an international LWML convention years ago when I was district president or something. And uh, the preacher preached on verse 6 of Genesis 22. Uh, uh, Abraham took the wood, the burnt offering, placed it on his own son. And himself, he carried the fire and the knife. Uh, the introduction there of the knife. And uh, the preacher uh, just gave a great sermon on, uh, on the fire, of course, being the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit in action, and the knife being God's word, you know, the sharp two-edged sword that Paul talks about, uh, which is the word of God, law and gospel. And, uh, and so I wanted to throw that in because of your closing comment there on why we're doing this Read Scripture Challenge in 2021. Because when you take the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit working in with and under the word, the knife, the sharp two-edged sword, and climb up the mountain of 2021, uh, you really are following the path of Abraham. So I just want to throw that in. I, I'll never forget that sermon. It wasn't preached by me, but it was... Uh, if well, I think hard enough, I know I'm who gonna, preached it. I'm going to gonna edit this part out now so that I can use that in a different sermon. Uh, <laughs> just kidding, folks. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, with you guys and everybody else. Uh, we'll talk to you again soon. God's blessings on reading God's word. <laughs>